quiet. It's starting. The All Color Tribe Podcast presents Black Engine, Ballad Number One, A Labor Alliance, an all cast audio epic starring MF Rex, Timbo Lean, Amy Davis, and Melissa K. Marks as King Mel, and the Dame Judy Dench as Big Motherfucker. Oh, yeah, Free Leonard Pelletier already? Howdy, hi, and what's happening, y'all? This is the All Color Tribe Podcast, and I am BW Sun. Well, we're here. The culmination of our podcast's first season, and the grand finale of our bridge presentation of the great American tale, Black Age, Ballad Number no. 1, A Labor Alliance. Thank you for including yourself in this audible adventure. As the author of this noise novel, I hope you liked it and haven't been forced against your will to listen. I need to thank Josh Anderson, Leah Carter, Sean McCain, and Paula Wyatt for helping produce this audio orchestra and always having my back regardless of the ongoing chaos that is my harebrained creative process. To the grand talents provided by all those who provided voice acting for us, y'all are great and I hope we can play together some more in the near future, continuing the crazy clamoring chronicles of Black Engine, Big Motherfucker, and Aya. Thank you everyone, I just can't say that enough. Last time we left off, A was trapped in a room after killing the Lord's Lion's false prophet Milo, while Black Engine and Biggins were outside fighting lions and pedophiles, leaving all bloody and expired in their wake. And Susanna was heading off with a paddle to handle her own business. I don't want to hold you up too long here on the front end. I'll holler at you when we're finished. Once more, thanks for participating. And now, on to the dope shit, shall we? Enjoy. <laughs> Chapter 40. Atonement. The house of worship is empty. Behind the podium, Willem is digging in a hidden compartment underneath the pulpit, raiding the secret stash of its well, clearly expecting for the worse. He doesn't hear Susanna enter. She's still holding the paddle and walks up past the pews to the lectern behind him. You're the worst kind of man. Surprise and guilt force him to fumble the coins. They bounce metallic on the sanctuary's ceramic floor. He looks up, seeing his young wife. Susanna, my dear. Seeing the paddle in her hand, he quivers. Willem stands slow, and she's looking at him, seeing her enslaver, her torturer. My name isn't Susanna. I was catching fireflies outside my Nana's house, and you stole me. And then you did a whole lot worse. Zuz- My name is not Susanna. The paddle cracks against Willem's knee and he collapses to all fours, mewling. Why would you think you can do the things you did to another person? What looks up at her is frail and terrified and old, harboring a broken knee. Halves of words and incoherent sounds dribble out from Willem's mouth. And ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them. It counts for girls too. She begins wreaking havoc on the mind, body, and soul of Willem with the paddle, until two of the three are no longer present in the holy house, and the third resembles lumpy mashed potatoes. the one percent us human beings and since we settled down and started this amazing thing that we call civilization we've done a bang up job of eliminating everything which falls under our gaze 83 percent of wild land mammals are gone 80 percent of marine mammals they're dead plants we've extinguished 50 percent of those oxygen makers they don't seem to understand resources are to be sold and not exhaled and 15 percent of fish have gone missing since we put our toes in the water. Everybody knows math doesn't lie, and the only thing math has to say is that we are winning. This holiday season, let's put aside our differences and take charge, solving the real problem at hand. How will we raise those percentages to 100%? Animals can't afford to live, after all. They don't have any money. And everybody knows anybody who doesn't have money 
should be dead. Happy holidays from the human race. We've never looked better. Chapter 41. Let's finish this. Black Injun and Big Motherfucker, following Susanna's hunch, walk up to the moot, the carnage of battle in their wake. I'm hungry as a motherfucker. Can you eat, lion? Putting his hand on the doorknob, there's a boom and buckshot rips through the doorway. Black Injun leaps aside the door, arm grazed. On the other side of the door, Michael, one of the last surviving sons, is guarding the entryway. Only way you're getting through that door is over my dead body. Your side is losing. We killed the fucking lions. Come on, bruh. Just walk away. You ain't gotta die today. Big motherfucker pulls out the grenade he's had in his pocket. He holds it up for Black Engine to see. Why the fuck wouldn't you use that on the goddamn lions? Fuck, biggins. Yeah, go ahead. Throw the fucking grenade. Last chance. Fuck you. Fuck me? Well, fuck you then. Big motherfucker unpins the grenade and tosses it through the buckshot born hole in the door. Smoke vacates the hole before the hinges give up and the door falls out of the frame to lie at Black Engine and Big Motherfucker's feet. Inside, on some stairs in the walls, are an exploded Michael, which consists of far less than not exploded Michael. Black Engine rips off the remaining shreds of the lion's robes he still has on. Biggins lost his with the lioness. They step over what Michael is now and make their way up to the stairs. Just ahead, the door finally splinters. Aya listens to the boom and feels the rumble in her feet. Then an axe crashes through and through again. She's got her sword ready. A couple swings and the door isn't much of a door any longer. Stefan is squeezing through, still held back by the table. He looks at Aya with his one good eye, the other just a lump of blood and gook, and raises an Uzi. You're gonna- She gives him no time to narrate. Aya cuts downward, the katana slicing through the air, and then through Stefan's wrist bone, connected to the hand bones holding the gun. Hand falling for the floor while the rest of him pulls back into the hallway again. The gun spits several rounds. Big motherfucker is the first up the stairs and into the hallway. He watches Stefan pull back from the door without a hand and an eye missing. Another son, Edmund, is wielding a large axe with both hands, looking back at him. Edmund starts to charge. Biggin unslings his sawed off and fires. Edmund changes directions and flings backwards, knocking into Stefan. The axe rotates through the air until it's half dug into the hallway wall. Black Engine follows Big Motherfucker in from the stairwell. Look at you! Using your gun and shit! Stefan is floundering on the ground. His good eye watches Black Engine take stance over him. Mercy. Letting his pistol bang, it couldn't be quicker than that, and it's all the mercy Black Engine has to give. Big motherfucker rips what's left of the door from the wall and tosses it aside to fall on Stefan and Edmund. The table takes a thoughtless push from the big man. He and Black Engine walk in and see Aya sitting on the ground hurt. Black Engine is preoccupied at first, looking at her work with a dead girl on the floor and the man all kinds of no longer living in the bed. Then he looks over to her. You okay, old hag? I get shot in the foot. <sighs> Big motherfucker scoops her up in his arms, each about the size of her. Yeah? Little girl stabbed me with a fucking fork, and a lion tried to eat me. Biggin's got his face all fucked up. It looks like his mouth now. Oh, here, before I forget. Black Engine pulls out the bunny doll and hands it to Aya. Her face twists and contorts, the last of her tears fall. She clutches the doll hard to her chest. He and Big Motherfucker stand unsure of what to do while she tries to dry out. This was Roberto's, my little brother's. He was two. He's dead now. My uncle Ernesto killed him. He killed my whole family. That's why I'm gonna be a gunslinger. I'm going to go back and kill Uncle Ernesto for what he did to my family. Black Engine steps past Helena's mutilated body to Glos Bogomilo, still in bed. The long antler lunged into his loins and chest a bloody, soylent Swiss cheese. Well, if a killer is what you finna be, gotta say, I think you well on your way. He taps the antler. It wiggles, but it's not going anywhere. What his name was? Glos Boga Milo. Glos Boga Milo, huh? Ugly with a dumb name. World's better with him, dead. So what's up with this place? Nothing.
Fellas, it's been a tough couple of years for us, hasn't it? Seems like every day we're being told we're wrong for just doing what we've always done since the beginning of time. Be a man. Are you tired of it? Well, me too. It was you who created this world with your own two hands. And after doing all the work, you're supposed to sit back and not enjoy the fruits of your labor? Yeah, I didn't think so. With the new year upon us, let's remind the rest who sits at the head of the table. We get the big piece of the chicken and every other thing we want because we're men and we deserve it. Remember, he who spares the rod spoils the subordinate. Man up and take what's yours. They'll thank you for it in the end. This has been a message from the human race. Chapter 42, All Tied Up. Hours after the fighting has ended, some girls have gone, some are leaving. Some are clearing and cleaning. Aya sits side saddle on a horse, her foot wrapped up next to a standing big motherfucker. He found a bottle of mead and sips from it. He found a few bottles and bagged them out. Black Injun is across the way, talking to two girls sharing a horse. He slaps the mare's rear. It jumps to a gallop and the girls take off. Black Injun waves them by and walks over. That was Kim and Gina, Spargo's daughters. Well, that's that. We did it, big motherfucker. On to the next one. He puts his hands together and calls for a timeout. Susanna walks up to the trio, hidden from the sun under a parasol rather than the ugly scarf. I just wanted to say thank you before you go for what you did. No problem. All in a day's work for legends. Black Engine and Big Motherfucker. You already heard our names, right? Tell everybody. You're staying here, Susanna? Some of us have been here too long. There's nothing else for us to go to. We'll wash away what this place was and make it something better. We'll be safe, finally. A group of girls walks up with Jersey bound and in tow. They announce that they found him hiding in the kitchen. Susanna walks over to join in the judgment. Black Engine looks at his friends and starts walking for the open gate. Big Motherfucker follows and leads the horse holding Aya alongside him. Where are the mules and the buggy and lightning? We gotta go get them. Don't worry, they're safe. Probably nobody stole them. Biggins, let me get one of them bottles. Big Motherfucker obliges. Black Engine uncorks and swigs. Reaching the bottle towards Aya, she refuses, so he keeps drinking. Wonder if them two old boys are still tied up to that tree. Chapter 43, Paths Part. The trio arrives at the cross in the road, the one with the rusty and weathered sign that no one can read. Aya is in her buggy stretched out, finally, with the bunny doll sitting co-pilot and rifle nearby if need be. Lightning is tethered to the buggy without a rider, and both Black Engine and Big Motherfucker are on foot. Aya pulls at the mules, bringing them to a stop. Black Engine and Biggins turn, looking to the girl. I'm not going back with you. Fuck you talking about? You're trying to fulfill your prophecy. I'm trying to kill my uncle. We're going to different places. So you going back to El Paso? I don't know. Big motherfucker walks over to Aya Awipi. She exits the buggy and surrenders to the big man's bone-bending bear hug, being lifted from the ground and then returning. Fair enough. Just knowing some real shit. You ever need us? You just get word and we'll be on our way. My daddy used to say you got two families. One you're born to and one that rides with you. So don't go on and think you ain't got no family, hear me? He takes the money he has on him out before anything emotional can happen and hands it out to her. Come take this. What's this for? Just take it. Nothing else? You're gonna need to get some new clothes ASAP. She's still wearing the ugly dress dyed in blood under her sombrero. Big motherfucker takes her up in another hug. Then she's back in the buggy, reining the mules back into motion. She turns and rolls away from her friends. They watch her slowly depart. Aye, right, Biggins. Let's go. They head down the road, headed back to Melville, the sun setting ahead of them. Think you got that big woman knocked up? I bet you did. Bet you put your nose in her booty and got her pregnant. You're a gross motherfucker, you know that? Y'all gonna have some ugly fucking babies, yeah? Behind them, Aya can be heard starting to sing that depressing song of hers.
Epilogue, The Last Lions. The gate of the lion's den is closed up ahead. Outside, wrapped in his robes and hood, Jersey's body hangs over a road from a tree about a hundred yards out. Jacob and Leonard walk up, their bodies still bare but now burnt from exposure with blistered feet. They look up to the fellow sun swaying in the sky. Shoot, think the guys that jumped us did this? There's a chirp in the distance. Leonard slaps at his neck like a mosquito just bit him, but the truth is far graver. Taking his hand away, Jacob sees the bullet hole in his brother's neck. Blood spurts, and Leonard drops dead. Another chirp lays Jacob down next to his twin. The wind gusts and sends the hanging lion overhead, swinging. the great american tale black engine ballad number one a labor alliance we at all color tribe thank you so much for tuning in and listening along that's why we made it after all now what you've heard was an abridged version if you'd like to hear the missing chapters they can be found in the full length work for six dollars at the all color tribe website you can also hear the first chapter of black engine ballad number two the dead president's initiative we hope to bring you ballad number two along with old hag versus the little cannibals Ayla's tale all her own in 2019. We're not exactly sure how we're going to do it since we have no funding at this time yet, but who knows what'll happen. So if you'd like to advertise with the All Color Tribe and help us stop having to make human race ads, we would love to hear from you. Or if you just have interest in helping finance our next production, please contact us via email through howdy at allcolortribe.com. That's H-O-W-D-Y at allcolortribe.com. You can also email us just to say what's up or whatever. That'd be fine, too. We'll reply. We hope you want to hear more ballads as much as we want to keep making them. Both the next ballad and a spinoff are all ready to go. So if you'd like a spoiler, Black Engine and Biggins will have to face some radical robots, as well as baby mamas in the next epic, while Aya finds herself sitting through a storm in an end of endless horrors. They only get better. Between here and there, look forward to some one-off stories to pop up via podcast and introduce some of the other colorful characters that exist in our universe. Thank you, everyone, as I keep saying, and bear with me as I read the credits aloud for our first season now. Black Engine, ballad number one, A Labor Alliance, an all-color tribe production. Thank you to Hunter Jankstrom, Connor Z. Martin, and Camaria Ross for providing their voices in our intro. The All-Color Tribe podcast is assembled and hosted by B.W. Sun. It's produced by J. Ross and B.W. Sun. Black Engine Ballad Number 1, A Labor of Lions, was scribbled, supervised, and assembled by B.W. Sun. Footing the bill, Josh Anderson, Leah Carter, Sean McCann, B.W. Sun, and Paula Wine. As for our international army of vocal soldiers, Tim Boleyn played Black Engine. Josh Anderson played Theodore Cadet and Drunk. Abby Blick played Helena. Amy Davis was Aya. Olivia Effinger was Anna Sophia. Felminderit was Perch. Alan Jones provided voices for Jacob, Leonard, Pitor, Bernard, and Philip. Sean McCann was work on Spargo. Melissa K. Marks was King Mel and Mother. M.F. Rex was the narrator. Kevin Ross was Rila. Blind Wanderer and Son played Glos Boga Milo, Man at Bar, Stefan, Michael, Corey, and Father. The song Lone Prairie was written by B.W. Son and performed by Pamela Pescua. Old Cooter was written by B.W. Sun and performed by Timbo Lee. Guitar riff by Josh Anderson. Indian flute performance by Oscar Soundscape. Native flute performance by Carlos Cardi. Violin performance by Ruth Bosco. This has been the All Color Tribe Podcast's abridged presentation of Black Engine Ballad No. 1, A Labor of Lions. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope to see you in Season 2. Peace, love, and everybody be safe out there. Now, as far as I can figure, only way we get better people is by being better to them children who grow up to be the people. So let's put an end to child abuse in its many forms. If you need help doing so, please contact any of the following ASAP. Child Help National Child Abuse Hotline, 1-800-422-4453. 
National Center for Missing and Exploited Children tip line, 1-800-843-5678. Rains National Sexual Abuse Hotline, 1-800-656-4673. Our future is on us from here on out, folks. If we let them ruin what's left, then we can only blame ourselves for the failing. All Color Tribe, Fetuo Amplificande Studium.